So in our last segment, we're talking about the uh, conversion Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs went through during the financial crisis to uh, become bank holding companies and put themselves under the regulation of Federal Reserve um, and benefit from that deposit base of customer banking deposits that became a new funding mechanism. And it was an example of the things that were happening in the private sector to uh, salvage you know, their financial solvency uh, from the results of, of the debt and the bad assets. You know, that's what we mean by debt, right? I mean, a debt with an asset isn't a problem. It's when you have a debt that is backed up by a bad asset, then you're left with the debt and you're not left with the asset. <laughs> that becomes the problem. And of course, that was the story of the financial crisis. And I'm going somewhere with this. But that, that was the same thing for Main Street, right? You had, you had individuals who had a debt they owed to a bank, for a mortgage on a home that was dropping in value. And if you move into Wall Street and wonder how this thing got so contagious and so systemic, that's the answer, is they had all these debts that they had taken onto their balance sheet. They had taken capital out of their balance sheet to buy so, some uh, exposure in the real estate world and mortgage world and so forth. There a lot of different things that were done with that. I'll, I'll spare you the details. But then when all was said and done, the debts existed and the assets had either blown up or deteriorated or whatnot. Um, and there was a lot more debt relative to the assets. So that leverage just accelerated the downward spiral. Well, the thing, the thing I want to talk about is what the Federal Reserve was then kind of forced to do. And, and when I wrote an article about this segment, I referred to it as the, the alphabet soup uh, the, of the Fed at that point, um, we, we know what QE was, this quantitative easing that became much bigger into, let's call it 2011. QE1 really started reasonably soon after the financial crisis, and, and QE1 was pretty small. They took a little break, and then they said, oh, no, we need more. We need to continue reflating the economy. They did a whole other round of QE2. But then when risk assets really took off is when they said, uh, actually, we're going to unload a bazooka here. And they did a QE3, so a third round. And the three put together represented very close to $4 trillion, $3.5 trillion of assets of, uh, that they basically bought with money that didn't exist. A lot of mortgage-backed securities and a lot of treasury bonds that were adding to the balance sheet of the Fed that become money that sits on the banks and excess reserves, but that they try to get reflating through the economy to, to stimulate various activity. So this alphabet soup over the course of the years following the financial crisis, QE becomes one of the examples. But right in the aftermath of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley going down their uh, bank holding company status, we started hearing things like TALF, uh, the the uh, term auction lending facility, there was a, a money market lending facility. There were, uh, obviously, we then know the most famous of all, which was actually done at the Congress level rather than Fed, was TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Um, if I were to actually go through with you all of the facilities and mechanisms that the Fed created out of the financial crisis to help the commercial paper market, to help the money market uh, um, sector, um, to, to help restore uh, a flow of capital. Um, you would really appreciate my idea of this being the kind of alphabet soup um, mechanism. And it was a sort of by any means necessary philosophy of the Fed. We have to do whatever we need to do to add liquidity to the market. And, and that became a philosophy that I think permeated for, for years following the crisis and is exactly what we're now dealing with in the market. Now, it's been a full 10 years later, we're looking back at it, but you look at the tensions that exist with the Fed unwinding a lot of that accommodative monetary policy, and, and the reality is, is that though that unwind has, is because there's been a lot of credit that's built up in the economy, and that was all on purpose, that they had reflated to kind of uh, offset the damage of the Great Recession. Um, but, but if you go back to September 2008, before they could reflate, they, had to, they, were, they felt dealing with a solvency crisis, and they, and they certainly were. 
And and so they decided they weren't going to let all of Wall Street go out of business. They let Lehman go. They bailed out AIG. And then at that point, we're as we're sitting here in our series, they're just one by one by one putting a different finger over a different hole in the dam, so to speak, day by day. And and that Fed uh, response of, of emergency measures was unprecedented. It got barely no press because, you know, bailing out AIG and and infusing capital into the great investment banks, those things are are you know pretty exciting and pretty interesting and pretty provocative. Um, but having a lending facility where money markets could access the discount window of the Fed and they could provide you know they were doing um, cross currency swaps where they were allowing foreign uh, central banks to get access to U.S. dollars, again, to provide liquidity in, in foreign swap transactions. Unprecedented, uh, underappreciated. These things were collateralized, so they were not exposing taxpayers to losses. It was a matter of kind of getting the pipes lubricated again of our global financial system. And it, and it was uh, indicative of the Fed's belief that they had to do anything necessary but it was also indicative of how bad things really were.